All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today. I know um, we had uh, some small technical difficulties uh, starting up, so I apologize that we're getting started a little bit late here. Um, but thanks for um, for joining us. So Scott, Paul Meese, and, and myself, Christian Burns, uh, weekly we are hosting uh, these webinars, these video webinars, to review various aspects related to clinical sites of the future. And today's session is going to be talking about uh, phase one studies and, um, you know, what it's like to start a phase one unit in 2018 and, and of course, uh, what do we envision that unit to look like into the future. So we're going to hit a few different topics in a short period of time. And I know we already had a lot of uh, interesting questions that we'll dive into, uh, hopefully, as we go through these 30-minute sessions. Um, Scott, anything yeah, else we, to add? Yeah, we definitely want these to be interactive. So if you uh, have any questions um, or anything that we talk about um, that you want to have a discussion about, um, definitely feel free to let us know as we want to um, definitely get you guys involved when we do these, uh, these weekly sessions. Perfect. So let's jump right into it, Scott. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so to start off, so we, you know, the reason why we wanted to do phase one um, and have a, a particular session around phase one is because we are consistently asked from sites, should they even open a phase one unit? And um, we've seen a lot of evolution, even within the past fa uh, five years, on phase one units, and um, they're great businesses to run. Um, However, we feel it's extremely important to understand the cost and logistics uh, behind opening one up. Um, phase I mean, one, isn't it? it oh, go I ahead. mean, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, I, I thought if you just have like a, a bed or an inpatient unit, that's a phase one, right? That's a, you know, and Scott, that's what we get all the time. We think we feel and have seen there's significant differences between what a true phase one it, one unit may be. So, difference between Having a patient stay, you know, overnight, one night, transferring an exam room into, um, you know, uh, putting a bed in it, and having it be an exam room most days every other week um, is obviously very different than putting together a sophisticated 25, 50 plus bed unit uh, where you have a number of amenities. So, Scott, how about um, jump in? What, what are some of those amenities um, that you've seen for this true phase one unit? What, what do you feel uh, those facilities should have? Well, it really should be more like a hotel. Um, you know, anything that you think when you go on a nice vacation that you would want, you probably want for those patients. So what do I mean? So obviously a comfortable bed, comfortable living space, um, and, and a lot of space. You know, you don't need to necessarily stack all the patients on top of each other. You want them to be comfortable, especially if for these multi-day stay types of studies. Um, you want a, you know, a smoking area, um, a nice uh, spacious bathroom, um, a place where they can do laundry, um, and even a recreation room. So somewhere where they can watch TV, play games, um, you know, card games, video games, depending on the age of the patients, you want something that they're going to be able to keep themselves occupied um, so that they're, you know, excited about doing the study. Yeah, it's it's a great point, and and we've seen that adaptab adaptability is absolutely critical. Um, so with a lot of, as Scott alluded to, um, a lot of the units where you're able to adapt the space based on when the beds may be full, but also utilize that space potentially for for studies, um, you know, that you may be running in other capacities when they're not full, is huge. Um, so, for instance, coordinator offices um, or other office space, you may be dropping beds into those spaces uh, or getting them, uh, you know, or preparing them and having them available for when a sponsor or CRO does come to your facility to check you out. So, essentially, that's some uh, different areas that we mean by adaptability. Um, and it also comes with equipment, right, Scott? We've seen that there's um, a huge difference between whether you have to buy all of the equipment or can you even rent some of the equipment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and one of the things that I know we wanted to touch on in this, uh, in this webcast um, is that, you know, the phase one work, you can't expect to have phase one work consistently. And if you've got a 50 bed space, you can't expect to have all 50 beds full all the time. So you want to be able to adapt. And if you've got a study where um, you need some sort of expensive equipment, but any other study you're going to do, you, you may not need that equipment. 
um, it may be good to look at renting it. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, some if a site is looking to get into phase one, they don't necessarily need to build out, you know, a full space with the full equipment needed, all the, the bed space. You want, as Christian alluded to, you want something that's adaptable where you can kind of, you know, run the phase one studies, but then use that space and use that money for something else um, if needed later on. Yeah. And these adaptive phase one units, though, <clears throat> from we, what we've seen is a huge potential expense. Um, you know, we actually uh, have a, a site that we've been working with for, uh, for quite some time, and it took them up to $1.5 million in expenses before they're able to see a return. And it took them up to three years to begin to see that return, um, which, you know, for some industries and businesses, that could be uh, pretty usual. Um, but particularly for starting a probably a two through four site, I know that, that a lot of people have different experiences there. So in thinking of that, um, and when I say 1.5 million, again, I just want to make sure that we're clear is Scott and I would be referencing that true phase one unit. So that's that 25 to 50 mm -hmm. bed unit. And the biggest shift in the, the infrastructure of a unit from what we've seen, especially over the past couple of years, is that huge facility that's going to be running a number of of you know healthy patient trials is is not of the norm for your boutique hotel like experience which is a lot of the sites that we work with those right. are, so those are not those CROs um, so what kind of trials would you see um, uh, you know in in one of these phase one units today Scott you want to you want to jump in yeah, well, I mean, the the studies we've seen have definitely changed from what you may have seen, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, now they're, you know, doing, you know, more of kind of uh, unique designs with their, with these studies where um, you can get creative with, you know, getting the patients to, uh, you know, patients that are excited about phase one and excited to do these studies. You can, you know, help them to, you know, work with you more and more on some of these studies. So, for example, one new trend we're seeing as we're seeing um, the single dose and multiple dose arms kind of working simultaneously um, with some of these studies. And so when you do that, you actually, there's ways based on um, the protocol uh, design, there's ways where you can have the single dose patients actually enroll later in the multiple dose studies so that you can have those patients that continue to come back that are excited about this research. Because, I mean, as Christian, um, you know, kind of uh, alluded to, these phase one studies are very different than your phase two through four. And you really need that person who's excited about doing this, especially because, you know, typically at that phase one stage, we don't know whether or not this drug is going to, you know, do something to correct whatever, you know, disease they're coming in for. You know, they're coming in, you know, they may be, you know, just doing it for the science of it. Um, so we need to uh, definitely take advantage of those, um, you know, those situations where we can, you know, maximize the, the resources we have. Well, I think that's a great point because I think a big misconception, Scott, of what you even had just alluded to is people, when they start phase one units today, they think they're going to be filling 50 to 100 beds for one trial. Right. Um, but we've seen the adaptive study design um, actually be something uh, of more of a trend that most sponsors mm -hmm. Uh, are going towards. And, and we've even uh, even recommended mm -hmm. companies do that, as you alluded to. So you run your MAD and SAD trials simultaneously mm -hmm. uh, based on, of right. course, those patients may qualify. But, you know, the interesting part is instead of those 50 to 100 patient trials, which, which definitely used to be of the past, these are more mm -hmm. cohorts of 8 to 12 and mm -hmm. these are patients that 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 have a condition in in a lot of ways, right. um, you know. So those those phase one units that maybe we can use CNS as an example. So if they're doing two through four trials and in, in CNS, mm -hmm. don't try to do rheumatology. You know, stick with a early phase right. CNS unit. Utilize the equipment. Mm -hmm. Utilize the uh, the staff that you have because at the end of the day. Phase one is really all about how many patients do you have access to that, that of course, may qualify for one of these opportunities. Right. And oftentimes you may have just one patient at a time coming in. You're not going to have, you know, as you said, 50 patients all coming in at the same time. If you've got a, you know, an intensive and a lot of these phase one studies procedure wise are very intensive with what the patient has to go through and um, all the different procedures that have to be done. Um, Oftentimes you're you're working with one patient at a time, so it really is different than you know what a lot of sites come to us and you know think of as phase one. Yeah, that's a great point. I think we even had a 
we had a, another friend of ours who owns a phase one unit. He, he refers it to it as military style um, because different than two through four where you're building this relationship and there's a bond mm-hmm. between your staff um, and the patient, um, you know, we're seeing more, it's more about what kind of data are we collecting um, from this patient mm-hmm. over, uh, of course, a, an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. And you don't see as much of that bond yeah. uh, potentially being there. Right. Yeah. Well, Scott, and because it's so data focused, yeah. I was going to say, just because it's so data focused, I mean, that, that kind of leads into, you know, more of the business development side. And, and, and Christian, you know, how, how can sites, because if a site does have the, the resources in order to, to do something like this, how do they set themselves up for, you know, landing one of these studies from a, from a BD perspective? That is a great point. And I think that hopefully, you know, what, what people have gathered so far from the discussion is, um, you know, we talked about the hotel-like experience. And in a lot of ways, you almost want to attach the boutique in front of the hotel-like experience. Um, mm. So if you're going to a Holiday Inn, you're going to a Fairfield Inn, you know, some of these chains, it's a very predictable experience when you're going there. And I think what we've seen for some of these phase one units that have been able to stand out amongst the rest is they're able to put together um, a number of things as far as, as far as an aggressive strategy and marketing mm-hmm. to really put themselves out in front of the rest of those sites. So what does your mm-hmm. site have that might be different? Um, mm-hmm. and, and Scott, I know, you know, when we hit upon this section, especially with the sites that ask us, we see, let's, let's, let's look at this in two ways. There's the marketing side. So what mm-hmm. kind of collateral or what kind of information should you put together to get yourself out there? And then what should you do to cultivate those new opportunities, right? Because, um, you know, it, it's, it's, th- these are trials where you need one to three to maybe even five sites for a study. So clearly the competitive right. nature is, of course, huge. Definitely. So Scott, yeah, I, I'll, how about, you know, since we go through this all the time, how about I go through the BD side and then we can go through the marketing side? Um, yeah, definitely. So on the business development side, um, we've seen that phase one studies usually have a different team and have different contacts, both at the sponsor and the zero level. Um, most large companies, I'm going to say, unfortunately, um, different than the other preferred partnerships that we have. Um, with the organizations is you don't see the team at the phase one level staying in the, um, as consistent as you would through the two f- through four. So essentially that means is a team may be brought in for an early phase trial and then depending upon whether that study is successful or not because the data is out there that one out of every 2,500 trials actually end up getting pushed through, uh, that team does leave and then there's a new team that comes in. So um, I guess you can say between a two through four trial, uh, usually you can do really well recruitment wise and hopefully you get more opportunities out of it. But, but we actually do see that it's a little bit more cutthroat because of the changes in, in that early phase side, uh, in that early phase side. So Scott, Definitely. how would we target sponsors and CROs for phase one? Well, for phase one, I mean, it, it's really, you know, it's almost like a separate uh, avenue for business development than the phase two through four, as you were indicating. So with a lot of these big CROs and pharma companies, um, it's a completely separate team. So everything that we've talked about in a lot of our webinars over the last year, as far as business development strategies and building relationships, um, building partnerships, all of that applies but it's more on, you know, but you have to essentially do it with a separate team that may or may not have any interfacing with the later phase teams. Another thing that you hit on that I think is is important um, that you've, uh, I think, mentioned a couple of times so far is that the data for the phase one is so important because if you think about it, a lot of these studies are first in man. A lot of these studies, it's the first time that these drugs have been, um, that they've collected any sort of uh, human data um, for these pharmaceuticals. And so the data is very, very important. And unlike with a phase two through four study, of course, we've talked about several times over the last year that the relationship you build um, is important. And if you enroll really well on a study, they're going to keep coming back to you. With these studies, if you enroll really well on a study, it is very transactional. And, and a lot of times, you know, you're going to have to uh, continue to build that relationship in order to continue to get that work. But one time, if you really messed up on the data and you really don't enroll well, um, we've seen that it's very, very hard to get back in with those companies, even more difficult 
than it is on the later phase studies. Yeah, that's a lot of really great points. I mean, it, it, repeat work is is so repeat work is pretty rare, and um, and it seems like there's a lot less loyalty when it comes to the relationships at the sponsor and zero level. Mm. Um, however, yeah, you know, I think as a uh, since maybe that would be more of a Debbie Downer in, in some ways, um, we do see that the the great thing is um, how you reach out to these companies is definitely different than two through four. Um, and I think this goes into the marketing strategy. Uh, we've seen a one sheet that breaks down a lot of things that we're talking about, number of beds, what kind of equipment do you have on, on site, what, what, uh, how big is the patient population that you have access to that may not even just be in your database, but also in the, the geographic location that you live in. Um, and create a video, create, um, really create the experience for a sponsor and CRO because um, I think what we've seen a lot differently is that you should not be thinking about one study when you get in with, with these companies. You should probably be thinking right. about how do I get them to come to my facility to see, you know, how great it may be. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's definitely very, uh, you know, a little bit of a different mindset than it would be for, for uh, a later phase study. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I think that um, – you know, it's some of the points that we talked about to make sure that we're clearing everything with marketing is we talked about the one sheet. So that would be probably very early on as soon as um, let's use Pfizer since they're always a great example to use. But as soon as we uh, realize that we have the potential person for Pfizer that uh, oversees the phase one opportunities, we'd probably want to send them our phase one, hopefully send them a video, send them a link to our website, which I, I would hope these days is up to par based on, um, you know, what we would uh, for CR unit having, mm. and then some sort of slide deck that probably goes into the details. That may be something that's better for an on-site visit. Mm -hmm. um, but those are some some of those key areas because if it does mm. take you 1.5 million dollars for this investment, which we've mm -hmm. alluded to earlier, we're not going to sit here and say that you should buy all of the equipment that you need to put on that one sheet. Um, however, right. you may rent something knowing you need that equipment for that particular study uh, when that organization comes to you. Yeah, and, and if you're telling me that that it takes, you know, $1.5 million to, to see anything um, on these studies, why would a site even want to do it? Well, it's a great point. I mean, I think um, since I actually had to answer this question within the past few weeks, um, someone who, who we do know is starting a phase one had asked if we would, you know, if, if, if we would do it. and. Um, I'm not going to say that it, we that we wouldn't want to do it, but it does take a ton of hard work, and you need a lot of time on your hands, and you really need to understand the details. We've talked about the equipment. Mm -hmm. We've talked about um, the business development. We've talked about the marketing. Um, but how about the staff? Let's not leave that out because I think that's a critical mm -hmm. piece. Um, what kind of staff should a site even have if they're planning to you know, run these overnight trials over these extended periods of time? Yeah, well, you definitely need a licensed professional there, you know, at all times um, while there is a patient there. Um, but you don't necessarily need a physician there 24 hours a day. Of course, you need somebody on call 24 hours a day in case something goes wrong. Um, but you definitely want that licensed professional there um, at all times. Um, a lot of times it's a nurse or, or somebody that has some type of a certification um, that they, you know, that we would feel comfortable obviously having them with the patients, um, you know, overnight if necessary. Um, but a lot of times, you know, as you guys know, with these phase one studies, um, there's the long doses and, and the long PKs. And so a lot of times if the PI should be on site for any of the dosing, they may need to put in some different hours as far as, you know, early morning, um, you know, late afternoon. But of course, the doctor does not have to be there, you know, all night um, based on any of the requirements. But they need somebody on call if there's any issues with, you know, food or any of the accommodations. Um, anything, again, you know, taking it back to how we started this, you know, anything that you would think you would need in a hotel, um, any of those resources, you know, make sure they have access to them, even if they're not, you know, on site 24-7. You know, I think a big point, uh, Scott, to, to what you just alluded to is we did talk about how one of the biggest misconceptions, which I'll repeat again, is that these are not huge studies that you have a whole bunch of patients mm -hmm. for? Um, the, the, you know, one of the standard criteria that we've seen though is you need about an you need an RN for every three patients. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
you know, based on the complexities of the data that you're pulling, we've seen that yeah. be pretty consistent. And then also for these larger phase one units, you know, we've even seen companies like PPD, um, they, they want to color coat the scrubs and the teams. Mm -hmm. So that's including the patients and the teams that are, of course, working on that opportunity in a certain color. Mm -hmm. So there's the differentiators between who can I go to if I'm a patient, if I need something. And then on the other side, um, you know, you may be running a couple different studies at a time. So you need to know who exactly might be in that trial. And again, of course, we're speaking of, uh, you know, something that probably wouldn't be a CNS trial where you have all of that overlap. Um, some exactly. other things I think that are important, Scott, that I'll just make sure that we jump into because we don't want to leave them out. Uh, where this big expense does come from is that you need to have a lab on site. Um, and obviously, as we know, a lab, um, you know, comes with a large expense in, it, in, in itself. Um, so it's a lot more technical than an outpatient, uh, of course, facility might be. You need a separate generator, uh, of course, AC unit, um, you know, probably more applicable in, in, in Florida and so forth. But, uh, you know, things like a laminar flow hood, um, you need a farm D um, on staff. That's, that's usually, uh, you know, I know a lot of the bigger units are going to have a pharmacy there. Right. Um, and then pretty much everybody needs to be trained to handle phase one drugs. Uh, and, and as we know, you start bringing up the SOP word, which, uh, which is always one of my favorite words, is... Um, you need an SOP for pretty much everything, and we know these Phase One teams from sponsors and heroes are going to be asking for that almost when they get into the door, right? right? Definitely. And those um, are things you want to have in place, you know, when you put together those that slide deck and that presentation mm -hmm. that um, that Christian had mentioned. I mean, those are things that um, sponsors are going to look for. So it isn't just, you know, to, to get back to kind of our where we started, you know, it isn't just having that inpatient unit, having the beds and saying, OK, I'm ready for phase one. Um, and we see that all the time. We see sites say, oh, I've got 10 beds. I can do phase one. There is, there's a lot that goes into it from a, a staff perspective, from a cost perspective, um, from a, a process perspective. Um, so we want to kind of, you know, if everybody can take something away um, from this webcast, it's that, you know, phase one, starting, you know, phase one capabilities with your site is a little bit of a, a larger task than a, a lot of sites really realize. Yeah, don't start down the street from where a CRO's phase one unit is going to be. We've seen that one play out a few different <laughs> yeah. times. But exactly. um, I know, we, you know we've you been doing these 30-minute sessions. Uh, again, Scott and I just kind of dove on a lot of the basic elements. Um, and we do have some, some questions here um, that we can review. Um, so one of those questions is actually um, based on eSource and... The interesting part, because that's a buzzword we've seen now throughout the industry more so than recently, but eSource really isn't new in phase one. Um, I know um, IQVIA, Pfizer, they're using companies like Omnicon who are already uh, pretty much uh, working within the space because of the, the data uh, that, that's obviously need, needing to be collected at that point. Um, Scott, another question here is how do you find phase one studies um, if you don't have those preferred partnerships? You want to take that one? So, yeah, and and I think we kind of hit on this a little bit um, earlier, but you know, to find those phase one studies, I mean, first off, you know, want to make sure that you have uh, the ability to, um, you know, to to come kind of get through everything that we talked about already. So, making sure you have those processes in place and that you have a plan for how you're going to, you know, get that equipment and get that space and um, be able to have all of those resources that we've already talked about. Um, but it really is about, you know, first creating that one sheet, you know, putting together um, all of your, um, your capabilities, you know, how many beds do you have? What is your staff experience like? Um, what indications are you set up for? What are your accommodations like? You know, do you have you know, a 42-inch TV? Do you have, you know, games for the, the patients to play? Um, all of those things, smoking area, you know, all of those things are very important um, for you to be able to put down. And then once you kind of get that initial interest, that's when you need to put together, you know, more of a, you know, a, a formal slide deck, you know, putting together um, you know, your capabilities, what SOPs do you have in place, you know, what studies, you know, are, are you, do you have experience with on the later phase side that you can apply that experience to the early phase side? Um, you know, what, uh, 
uh, you know, kind of what are you looking for and then what can you offer these sponsors and CROs? Um, because as, as Christian um, had indicated earlier as well, um, as, as everybody knows, it, it's been trending towards CROs owning their own phase one units. So the competition is getting even more for, you know, even, even stronger for these phase one studies. So it is very important to be able to differentiate yourself. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that, because I thought that was a great breakdown, is that what we've seen um, working with a lot of the phase one units that we support is um, you do have to put in a lot of bids. And um, we have actually seen CROs be able to push off more. That, that essentially, they're going to be cheaper um, than, unfortunately, most of the, the larger phase one units. And that's because they do... Uh, and, and of course, this is not going to be for every single opportunity, but they do have a lot of that right. staff that is there. And I think that that is why the preferred partnership is so important that you make sure that, you know, you could try to identify those individuals at the large sponsor, at the CRO. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you do, you know, hopefully can get more work. And to give you an idea of the volume, Definitely. because we did pull some numbers before this, um, is that even through some of these preferred relationships, most sites may be doing two to three trials in one year. So that is substantially different than a lot of the other partnerships that, that uh, ClinEdge and BTC have, um, where if for two through four sites, we're, we should be doing a heck of a lot more than that. So that hopefully can give you a little bit more background on the volume and ask the appropriate questions early on. So if you do uh, give a, a bid for a company that would like one for your phase one unit, um, try to identify, you know, do they have any, um, you know, is there any particular things that you're looking for? Um, is there any particular cost that you're looking for? And, and I know these are some measures that you right. would go through for other trials, but I just think it's that much more critical at the phase one level because they're only going to select a few sites, very different than selecting 100 sites. So um, obviously you have to bend over backwards to stand amongst the rest. Definitely, um, definitely. We got one more question here. Um, Scott, and uh, what age range um, would we say would be the most difficult uh, for phase one trials? And actually, that that is a, a phenomenal question because I think this is another mm -hmm. uh, misconception that we actually see the the um, you know upwards of uh, you know uh, younger. And I wanted to say 17, but um, of course we do do pediatric mm -hmm. trials in phase one as well. But up to that 35 age group that, of healthy. Um, patients, that um, tends to be a little bit easier because you can go to colleges, you can go to certain areas to have a great recruitment strategy to get these healthies. Right. And then you go from 35 and over, um, we start thinking of, you know, uh, you know even 50 and over um, is going to be a heck of a lot more challenging. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that, that that's what yeah, I and a lot of times copy I think to add. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times those those older patients, you know, they're going to need. Um, you know, a lot of times even more accommodations, and depending on the study, um, you may need space for the caregiver as well. Um, if we're talking about um, certain indications where the, um, you know, the patient is not as ambulatory or, you know, there's, there's certain, you know, reasons why the caregiver needs to be present, um, when you're thinking about that comfortable space, you're going to have to think about areas for the caregiver as well. So a lot of times the older the patients are, um, a little bit more care that you have to take um, when you're putting together, you know, your space for the phase one study. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do see that we have some other questions. So what we'll do is if anybody, um, you know, please reach out to us via social, reach out to us, um, you know, if you need to, it's webinars at ClinEdge. Um, we'd be happy to pass over any examples of some of these items that we're talking about. Uh, I think a lot of people know that from the past. So any uh, examples of one sheets, um, any examples of strategies and how we'd introduce ourselves. Um, certainly, we gave you a very broad number with $1.5 million. And um, the reason why we didn't want to break that down to the absolute T in the, in the 30 minutes is because every phase one unit does have a different expectation for what they're right. doing. But certainly happy to brainstorm anything with anyone. Um, but thanks for joining us today. We uh, very much appreciate it. Hopefully, you guys learned several things. And uh, join us uh, every week, same time. To, uh, to, see the, um, to see all of the different uh, video webinars that we're going to be hosting. Thank you. Definitely. All right. Thanks. Bye.